Um, just a reminder that our church is located at 6202 South Tyler Street in Tacoma, Washington, right across from Gray Middle School. And uh, our classes, or rather, I should say our Sunday school classes, begin on Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. We have classes for all ages, and our adult class is uh, live streamed on YouTube on our YouTube channel, which is very easy to find. It's the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian YouTube channel. If you ask for that, uh, it'll take you to our, our channel. It's good to see the Robinsons with us tonight. Um, I understand they had a little difficulty catching up with us this morning because we were slow uh, getting on, but uh, glad they, they finally made that contact. Um, good to have the Andersons with us this evening as well. Uh, greetings to the Andersons. Um, we have a 10.30 a.m. worship service at the church, um, and uh, that service is also uh, live on YouTube, but uh, it takes place at the church uh, where our congregation meets. And uh, next Sunday, next Lord's Day, We'll be having a message from 1 John, chapter 1, uh, the latter part of that chapter, and also uh, joining in the Lord's Supper together. So that's coming up next Lord's Day. Good to have Dr. Battle with us. Um, Dr. Battle and uh, Pastor Lynch are um, professors at Western Reform Seminary, and we always appreciate their joining us on our, our evening messages. Uh, we're here on Sunday nights from 6 to 7 p.m. with our evening message. doesn't always go all the way to 7, but um, within that hour. And uh, we also have small groups that meet during the week. I encourage you to, to think about being a part of one of those. And uh, then we also have Bible studies, uh, ladies' Bible study and men's Bible study, and also a youth group that meets. So we have a a full schedule at the church, and as I was mentioning earlier, um, we are the we sponsor as a mission work Heritage Christian School, and uh, Heritage is in University Place. And uh, if you're interested, or you know someone who's interested in getting an education for their children uh, with a Christian perspective, then Heritage is the place that you ought to look into, at least for children from preschool age up through eighth grade. It's good to have the Lanes with us tonight, Dave and Linda. Welcome to you this evening. It's time for us to go ahead and get started with our message tonight. And uh, I'm going to, first of all, just uh, take us to um, a passage that uh, will help us to get our minds and hearts, I think, uh, prepared uh, for worshiping the Lord tonight. It's Psalm 135 and verses 1 through 3. And it begins like this. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. And while we're not going to do any singing together tonight, we can certainly sing to the Lord in our hearts. And so let's uh, bow now and ask the Lord to bless us tonight in our study. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, your word commands us to praise you. And Lord, when we are honest and forthright, um, we never have any problem finding a cause, a reason uh, to praise you and to glorify your name. You are good and you are just and you are righteous and you are holy. You are wise and you know all things. You are all powerful, and Lord, you are uh, all loving and mercy. And Lord, we thank you for uh, those attributes that belong to you. And Lord, we thank you for sending your son to die for us on the cross at Calvary, that we might not just hear about you, but Lord, that we might know you. 
that we might be restored in our communion with you through his sacrifice for us at the cross. Lord, we pray that our communion with you tonight will be real and that, Lord, you will bless your word to our hearts, that you will feed us as your sheep. We're scattered about, but your eye is upon us. You're present in every place. We know that you're present with us tonight. And we ask you to bless us as your people for Christ's sake. And it's in that precious name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we ask these things. Amen. So I'm turning for our scripture reading tonight to uh, Proverbs chapter 24, verses 23 through 34. Proverbs chapter 24 beginning in verse 23. Proverbs 24, 23. There also, these also are sayings of the wise. Partiality in judging is not good. Whoever says to the wicked, you are in the right, will be cursed by peoples abhorred by nations. But those who rebuke the wicked will have delight, and good blessing will come upon them. Whoever gives an honest answer kisses the lips. Prepare your work outside. Get everything ready for yourself in the field, and after that, build your house. Be not a witness against your neighbor without cause, and do not deceive with your lips. Do not say, I will do to him as he has done to me. I will pay the man back for what he has done. I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense, and behold, it was all overgrown and thorn with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want like an armed man. May the Lord bless our reading from his word together uh, this evening. It has been said that work was heaven's first law. That assessment is made in light of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. In Genesis 2, 15, before the fall of man into sin, we're told the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and keep it. So God made man to work. And so the first commandment was work. Now, as such, it was rudely and tragically impacted by sin in various ways. But it wasn't changed. We were built and created to work. This is passively evident, we might say, in the fact that Whenever one does a good job at something, and I mean truly a commendable job, not just a a mere participation grade job, but but a really good job, it produces in men and women and children a feeling of satisfaction and well-being. We did a good job and we wanted to do a good job and there's something satisfying about it. But some of the inherent problems in respect to work that come with sin are highlighted for us in the book of Proverbs. There's the passage we just read. This is Proverbs chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Proverbs 6, beginning with verse 9. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. And you see that has the same tone to it as the passage we read a moment ago 
from later in Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 10, verses 3 through 4, this is Proverbs 10, beginning with verse 3, the Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack, slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. In chapter 12, Proverbs chapter 12, we have these two verses. First of all, verse 24, the hand of the diligent will rule while the slothful will be put to forced labor. And then verse 27, Proverbs 12, 27, whoever is slothful will not roast his game, but the diligent man will get precious wealth. There's a whole lot of problems that have attached themselves to the idea of work, and they relate to the idea of idleness and slothfulness. But the whole matter of work was cast in a new character after the fall. Man was given his assignment to work, but then something changed when the fall came. We read about it in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. So I'm reading now from Genesis 3 and verse 17, where God says to Adam, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So where once work was a pleasant satisfying uh, part of man's life after the fall it changed in its character and now the ground could only be um, turned into something serviceable by pain and thorns and thistles began to, to rise up in the field and it's only by the sweat of his face that a person can eat bread now in Christ, work fully regains its dignity and its place of blessing. Um, John Lilly says, It is indeed the will of God now, as it was in the beginning, that every man have something to do and do it. That law is not repealed in the church, but ratified and blessed. And so we find the Apostle Paul writing to the Thessalonians about this matter. And it's here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning at verse 6, that we find his instruction on this matter. So now we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6. Paul writes there, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you have received from us. Now, as we look at this section of, of Paul's epistle, and we're getting now towards the end of it, this section begins with a clear command from the apostle in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as such, it comes with obvious and compelling authority. Paul has reserved his strongest rebuke for the people of Thessalonica for the close of this epistle. And it comes on the heels of his commendation to them for their spirit of obedience that he speaks of in verse 4. So if you look back up there in chapter 3 to verse 4, 2 Thessalonians 3, 4, you read this, Paul says, and we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. And that commendation is followed by the words here, so now we command you. And Paul says, we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and you will do the things we command, so here's a command. And he then offers this commandment. 
Now, there's speculation as to what was at the heart of this idleness or disorderly walking. And most assign it to the fact that some in Thessalonica had misunderstood at best or were taking undue advantage at worst regarding the confusion around Christ's imminent return among them. Lilly, John Lilly, believes that a portion of the church there had become sort of a wandering band, reflecting more the confusion and excitement of a mob rather than the orderly operation of a grounded church. And they were causing problems within Thessalonica. Now, it's important to say that others approach the opening explanation here, that is, these first words, as a bit wider in meaning, and believe that the idol are then offered as an example of what it means to walk in a disorderly manner. In that case, Paul is identifying anyone who would transgress the limits or the bounds or the order of his or her calling. That would be the one who is walking disorderly. He informs the members of the church to sail clear of anyone who's living in a manner or habitually behaving in a way which doesn't conform to the traditions or practices which they had received from Paul and the others. Ferguson says that Paul calls them here to withdraw from or have no familiar intimate fellowship with any brother or Christian in external profession who walks in a disorderly way. By external profession, he means outwardly they say they're Christians, but there's not fruit in their lives and so on. So here we see, as we look at this scene, as Paul calls on them to do this. First of all, the practical results of excommunication. It is not shunning in the cultish sense that you see in cults and, and in religious bodies that are uh, more superstitious than biblically grounded, gra grounded, excuse me. But it's a carefully separating ourselves and our testimony from any person who persists in sinfully, in sinfully behaving in a disorderly way. Lily describes the action in this way. It's to give those who walk disorderly, and all others for that matter, a clear understanding by unmistakable action on our part that we have no sympathy in and offer no approval of that one in his or her misconduct. That we are not justifying it, we will not approve it, we will not accept it, nor will we ignore it. So that we can't be seen as being responsible for it in any way. If they want to take that path, then they take it on their own. But they're not going to be helped in it. They're not going to be supported in it. They're not going to be justified in it by those who believe that we should walk in the way of God's word. When those who profess to be believers and disciples of Christ walk contrary to the word, they're to be treated this way because by their behavior, they bring shame on the gospel. Paul addressed the Pharisaic Jews by saying this, and this is Romans chapter 2 and verse 23. Talking to those Jews, Paul says in Romans 2, you who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. And here is, and here he, in, in 2 Thessalonians, he's offering a parallel statement. He's saying, in effect, those who claim to live for Christ dishonor him by living to sin and self. They're making a claim to one thing, but they're actually doing another. And it's the same as the Pharisaic Jews who were boasting in the law, but dishonoring God by breaking it. Those who claim to live for Christ dishonor him by living to sin and self. Keeping a wide berth from those who behave in such a way 
accentuates not only the rebellion, rebelliousness of the disorderly, but it also accentuates the true nature of sin, especially its contagious and its defiling qualities. Paul, in speaking to the Corinthians who had some problems with those who were living sinfully and professing to be followers of Christ, Paul said, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Paul says there, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. And then we come down just a little further in the chapter, 1 Corinthians 5 at verse 9, and Paul says this, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So Paul's being very careful here in writing to the Corinthians to make this distinction. I'm not telling you to, to not to, to stay away from anyone in the world who may be involved in these things. That's what men of the world do, and you, you'd have to go out of the world not to be associated with them. But in the context of the church, in the context of the relationship of believers, if there's one who insists that he's a believer, or she insists she's a believer, but who lives in sin, then with that one, you should not eat and should not associate. We have to be careful at the same time to treat them, Paul says elsewhere, properly. So that as we are dealing with them, we are not dealing with them with indifference or with bitterness. We're not saying, oh, I have nothing to do with you and I don't care what you do or what happens to you. That's not what's being called for here. What's being called here for is I can't be in fellowship with you because you're walking in this sin and that's detrimental to your soul and to mine and to the souls of others. So it's not indifference and it's not bitterness. Um, they deserve whatever they get. That's not what's called for here. It's here also that we learn that there are both good and bad traditions. People often make the mistake of condemning all tradition, but something is not evil or wrong simply because it's traditional. In fact, it may be useful and perfectly proper. Many factors enter into the assessment of a tradition's legitimacy, including its origin, its nature, and its design. If it is anchored in sound doctrine and truth, if its nature is such that it's holy and harmless and its design is to honor and glorify God and his word, not to replace it, not to distort it, not to detract from it, then it might have a legitimate place indeed. In this case, the origin was apostolic. Its nature, the nature of the traditions Paul is talking about here, their nature was practical and biblical in character. And the design was the glory of God and the blessing of the church. As believers embrace biblical doctrine, and as they practice biblical living, a certain marching in rank, so to speak, develops. Now, I'm going to be careful using that term because we're not talking about a lockstep commitment, but we're talking about a unified front, so to speak. When believers are relying on the word of God as their only infallible rule of faith and practice, and they draw from that word how they ought to live and what they ought to do, there's a consistency that's going to appear in the lives of these people. 
there's an orderliness that's going to appear in their lives, even from generation to generation. And that's what Paul's talking about here, that orderly walking that comes from being in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ and being ruled by the word of God. But there were those people in Thessalonica who were striking out on their own. They need, says Paul, to be left on their own. They shouldn't be allowed to be to be to appear to be a part as though they were walking in rank when they have chosen to walk out of rank, so to speak. Now, in verse 7, Paul says this, For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not, not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. So nextly, Paul reminds them that they ought to imitate and follow the examples that he and the others had set before them during their days with and among them. He states first that they saw, or that is they comprehended and understood the fact that they ought to, or that is that it was proper or necessary or even required of them that they should mimic Paul and the others as they were following Christ, as they were being ruled by the word of God. It wasn't extraordinary, but it was the expected thing among them that they would follow that example. And that principle appears in several of the New Testament epistles. In Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews 13, the last chapter of Hebrews, verse 7, we read there, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. In the third epistle of John, in the 11th verse, in 3 John, we read, Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. So that's what he states first. You, This was clearly before you, that you should be following us as we followed Christ. Then he emphasizes that he, Silas, and Timothy did not walk out of rank themselves or in any improper or disorderly way. And he then offers an example or references a model of behavior which demonstrated just how that applied in this situation among them, reminding them how he and the others supported themselves so as to not be a burden to anyone. The church in Thessalonica was by no means made up of wealthy individuals at the time. And to carry on the work, all needed to be contributing, including Paul and his fellow laborers at that point. I believe that rather than a specific rule at this point, Paul uses this as an example. In other words, he's not saying that this is the rule for how the church should be ruled or run. But this is an example that I'm setting before you so that you can see this general truth. It's an example in the context. And you can see it in the first chapter. He's using it to illustrate a larger point. If we go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we go back to the first epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians, and the second chapter, we read this beginning in verse 5. 2 Thessalonians 2, 5. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, 
because you have become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. The message here that, that Paul is, I think, emphasizing is that the message is the thing, the gospel. Nothing should be allowed to hinder it, particularly nothing in one's behavior. It was more important that the gospel go forward unburdened and that Paul and his co-workers demonstrated these principles for emulation than that they exercised their rights at the moment. That just wasn't what was best for what was going on in Thessalonica at the time. And that's, that's the lesson here. We need to do whatever is required of us so that we can bring forth the message of the gospel clearly and plainly and, and just try to remove everything that might be a hindrance to it. Later, as the church is matured, Paul would say this, and this is to 1 Timothy, or rather to Timothy in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, Paul says this, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. There's a danger, especially in an affluent society like ours, to equate the blessing of God with the possessions of or accumulation of earthly things. Solomon spoke to this in Ecclesiastes 9, in verse 1. In Ecclesiastes 9, 1, Solomon says, But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. Neither possessions or lack of them clearly indicates the blessing of God. The rich man fared well, and Lazarus didn't. But it's clear who was the richer of the two men. Solomon ends this part of his observation with these words. And now this is Ecclesiastes chapter 9, beginning with verse 9. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love, all the days of your vain life that he has given you unto the sun, because that is your portion in life, and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol, to which you are going. Again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those who not with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. So Paul's point is, the occasion when we were in Thessalonica required us for the gospel's sake, to labor among you. And we did it for the testimony of Jesus Christ and for the furtherance of the gospel. We could have done otherwise, but we determined this is what we should do. And we knew God was blessing us, not because big offerings were coming into Thessalonica to provide for us, but because God was blessing his word. And so we knew the Lord was with us. Paul presses further his point by adding this in verses 10 and 11 now. We're back in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, he says, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. There can be no question about the command here. 
John Lilly says, for also, not only by our example did we indicate the rule, the diligent application to your secular callings for your own support, but by express precept also. So you have these two witnesses. We told you what to do, and then we lived that before you. If you will not labor, then you should not eat, Paul says, specifically of the labor of others. Now, this was no new instruction or commandment. Paul had already made this known while he was in Thessalonica, and that aggravated the matter among them. Ferguson says, sin done against knowledge, uh, sins done against knowledge have in them a singular weight and aggravation beyond sins of ignorance. In this case, you had both command and example being neglected or ignored, leading to shameful behavior that was hindering the work of the gospel. And that's the point, that nothing that, that, that hinders the work of the gospel should be allowed to get in the way. In fact, all the notoriously idle would fit this description because no believer is called to idleness, but rather constant activity in the service of the Lord, whether we're talking about in the context of our homes or whether we're talking about in our families, uh, larger families, or whether we're talking about in our community or at work or wherever it is, we are called to be at work for the Lord, to serve him. Now, some think this may have been a Jewish proverb. If you don't work, you don't eat. And they believe that if that was so, it was based on Genesis 3.19. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. It's by the sweat of the face you eat. If you don't sweat, you don't eat. And that's the rule. But some are of the opinion that it was an even more common shop saying. That is, that it was something that was common in business, prevalent in general society. Either way, it takes on a new significance here in Second Thessalonians. Then Paul reveals that it is being made known to him that there are those among them who spend their lives in a disorderly way, not working as they should, but literally doing nothing but doing around. That's the literal translation of the Greek there. Ellicott uh, suggests that it might be uh, translated doing no business but being busy bodies. A.T. Robertson quotes him there. Robertson goes on to say this, these theological deadbeats were too pious to work, but perfectly willing to eat at the hands of their neighbors while they piddled and fret, frittered away time in idleness. It's ironic, I think, that the first opposition to the gospel in Thessalonica was carried out by just such men in the general society of the city. If we go back to Acts chapter 17, where we read about Paul's time in Thessalonica, and in verse 5, Acts 17, 5, we read, but the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble, idle men who, were not, who weren't working, who weren't doing anything, that's the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring him out to the crowd. So here's this church which was originally harassed by idle people. Now in it, there is this group who are idle themselves. Ferguson describes their behavior in this way. They do nothing at all. To wit, in those things which they ought, and to which they have a calling, and yet are busybodies, and but too diligent to wit about those things which belong not to them. The point is, as Ferguson says, Paul had commanded and by his apostolic authority enacted for a standing law that whosoever, having otherwise strength and opportunity, will not work that is, employ 
either his body or his mind or both in some honest labor for promoting one way or other the good of mankind, such a man should not eat. And Paul has set that rule down by his apostolic authority there in Thessalonica. And now there was this, there was this group within the church who was not doing that, but who were remaining idle. It's not uncharitable for the church to have this rule. It's not the church's duty to feed men and women in their willful idleness. Some people get mistaken about that, but it's clear that that's, it's not the church's duty to feed men and women in their willful idleness. There are situations where there's poverty or illness and so on. The church does have a responsibility to respond there. But if it's just a matter of willful idleness, the church is not under an obligation to help someone in that situation, other than to help them get a job or to help them get the training that they need for a job. In fact, it's to aid them in their sin if we do help them, which is sinful in itself. In addition, helping them may rob the church from being able to help someone whose need is necessary. And it does this in two ways, either by depleting the available funds or by creating a, a bitter resentment in those who would otherwise give generously. They're laboring, they're working, they're doing all they can to provide for themselves. They set some aside to help others, and if that, that which is set aside is turned over to people who are willfully idle, it has the potential of creating a real bitter resentment. Why should I work and put this aside for them when to feed them when they're not working at all? One last observation here before moving on. It's the nature of men and women, children as well, to be doing something. And we see that that's the case here. They are idle in regard to legitimate behavior. But that doesn't mean that they're not without employment, does it? They're not doing what they should be doing. But boy, are they busy in matters that are none of their business. It's not that they're totally idle and just sitting like lumps somewhere. Oh, they're very busy. Just not busy doing anything to provide for themselves, but to intrude in the lives of others. It's one of those sad truths that it's those who are doing little or nothing who are most critical of those who are working hardest. Now in verse 12, Paul says, now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Paul now addresses these deadbeats, and he says, we command and encourage them. That's the way it's translated in the ESV. But elsewhere, this word is used, it's generally translated with the stronger term, exhort. We command and exhort them. We command and call them to account, making it clear that they ought to go to work. And what follows is a general command for godly living in the world. Work, sitting still, without bustle and commotion, and keep on eating your own bread, what you have earned by your own labor. He describes this matter more carefully to the Ephesians, where he's dealing with thievery. Here we find a sort of thievery too. But notice the description of work that he offers there. This is Ephesians 4, 28. Ephesians 4, verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Idleness manifests itself in various ways, all of which are harmful. 
when it impacts families, it can bring them into poverty and a spirit-crushing dependence, as Proverbs suggests. Idleness can open the door to all manner of mischief. Baxter says, idleness is the season of temptation. It is Satan's seed time. It is then that he has opportunity to tempt men to malice, revenge, and all other villainy that is committed. So we see that how it can be oppressive to the family from the passages we already looked at in Proverbs. We can see how it can become a door to mischief. When it becomes a systemic part of any society, it can run a nation into the ground and ruin it. One historian says of Rome, just prior to the collapse of that great kingdom, the masses were eminently idle, not living by the labor of their own hands, but by the indulgence of a government of a government which pandered to their worst passions because it could not check them and deemed it a political necessity to demoralize those classes which it must otherwise have been compelled to fear. That wasn't just written recently with an eye towards what may be happening to a certain extent within our own country and, and meant for comparison with Rome. That was written over a hundred years ago as an observation on what was what literally went on in Rome uh, by a man named Shepard who was a professor at Oxford University. And herein lies the great danger in a permanent ruling class as well. Living off the labor of others, that class is most often busy but not in producing or accomplishing anything, but in meddling in all manner of things that are really none of their business. Now, I realize that that's a common complaint of socialists, and it's employed as an argument for the implementation of communism or socialism, but that's not the answer. The answer, is, as always, is found in the scripture. The answer is to take that ruling class that's idle and put them to work. Work, earn, and live on that which God in his wisdom apportions to you. That's what Paul is saying here. Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 8, 1 Timothy 6, 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. When people get to the place where they don't have to support themselves, but they're able to live off of the work and labor and strain of others, it's a dangerous situation. It can lead negatively to problems like socialism and communism, where they do whatever they need to do to preserve their position so that they can remain idle, or it eventually leads to the collapse of that society. There is virtue in everyone working. And if they don't work, Paul says, they shouldn't eat. The Savior's admonition to you and me is not, wait until I return. His admonition is, work until I return. Work until I return. And that's what we're called on to do as God's people. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for this instruction from the apostle. We understand, Lord, the wider application of the principle. Lord, we pray that you would keep us from indulging anything in our lives which may interfere with the work and the message of the gospel. Help us, Lord, to overcome those things, those weaknesses that, that we have to deal with that interfere with uh, that going forth unburdened of the, the word of God. 
Lord, we pray that your word would go forth freely. And Lord, we think of the specific problem that existed there in Thessalonica with those who were idle and not working and Father not providing for themselves and how that was interfering with the testimony of the church and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thankfully, Father, in our midst, we don't have a plague of idleness. But Lord, there may be other things that we need to give careful attention to that are impeding the work of the gospel. And Lord, help us to put everything aside for the furtherance of your kingdom and of your word. Father, we uh, pray that you would guide us as individuals, guide our church, and Lord, have mercy on our land. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.